Imagine a Lamborghini with a Datsun motor. <laughs> I reckon it would look pretty good, but I just question whether its performance would actually stack up to what you originally thought. <laughs> Some, this somewhat it, it represents what happens in the sheep industry, and that I think a lot of our selection decisions are based on visual appraisal. There's very little knowledge of the objective, economically based um, data behind that animal. <coughs> I'd like to first of all thank a, a, few, a few people. Um, first of all, my sponsor, the William Buckland Foundation. Um, equally, Nuffield Australia. It's been an incredible journey, and I thank them. To my employer at the time, Burgess Rural, and particularly <coughs> mentioned to Jan Evans and, and the team there, and, and I'm so thrilled that Jan's come along today with Martin. Um, so thanks heaps, Jan. Uh, my GFP group, incredible group of people. Um, the Australian Industry Contacts. Um, a lot of you are here today and you know who you are, so thank you very much. Um, particular mention uh, to Ken Solly. Ken's just been the most immense support to me throughout the couple of years. So thank you, Ken. Um, and obviously to my family, um, who take up a, at least one table in this room tonight. <laughs> this afternoon, sorry. So thanks to all my family members. So I started this journey really um, at the drafting gate. Um, and really frustration at the drafting gate, and this wasn't because I was mucking it up, it was really because um, as I was drafting the ewes off the lands, I was frustrated because I, there was so much variation in the lambs, but I just couldn't put a, put a finger on um, any ability to identify or select on that. There was just no information to do much about that. So that's sort of where it all began. And so. My topic, my sort of, my presentation today will cover off on three main points. One, one is the focus on production. <coughs> Secondly, I'll have a look at the product and, and the importance of feedback in our into our systems. And thirdly, I look at maternal efficiency and how important that is in our production systems. At the end of the day, I think there's an, an enormous amount in the sheep industry, um, heaps of potential left, and it's an exciting area to be in. So, number one, a focus on production. And I, um, traditionally in sheep, you know, and, and, and um, at, the, at the present time, we, we, we work on, on the law of averages, and I just wonder whether we're, by averaging, we're really only identifying a few sheep in our flock, and I'm really interested in the range rather than the average. Um, so should, should production be the focus, or should it actually be the outcome? And I wonder how <laughs> production actually interacts with um, the one, reproduction, and two, the product that we're actually producing. And have we got a, the right balance of that happening? Ultimately, we have to align what we do with our profit drivers, and so working out what are we actually getting paid on. So I had a look at the, um, the last 44 years of uh, the Farm Monitors Project, which is a, a benchmarking project that happens in Victoria. And I just had a look at the, some, these are only some of the main um, benchmarking data, but it just surprised me that, and you can see there that um, wool per hectare is really fairly stagnant. Um, the wool price is pretty stagnant. Uh, lambing percentage is very stagnant in both prime lamb and merino. But the income that we're getting from our prime lamb per head has gone up significantly. So this just, I guess, emphasised my, my, my ideas around um, maybe shifting our thinking of what, or work, you know, basing our decisions really on the profit drivers of the business. I think for a balanced system, we really have to combine this product, production and reproduction um, to, to really get the maximum out of our businesses. The use of technology, and as um, James mentioned, the use of um, electronic tags in sheep's the current technology available. Um, enables this system to potentially work a, in a very effective way. Um, and I think we really need to, to look at this um, to get the most out of it. So I headed off, but I didn't actually head to a sheep farm. I headed to an apple farm. And the guy was really stoked that he could actually keep, teach a sheep farmer about sheep, farming <laughs> apples. So this guy, what, what impressed me about this this operation, we actually visited this on our GFP and I went back on a personal um, visit to this guy. And um, what impressed me is his transparency through from the, the apple on the tree 
right through the apple in the box and everything that happens in between. And the fact that he can make decisions on the tree and the product on the tree based on the market um, in terms of adding water at different times, fertiliser at different times, changing the shape or the colour of the apple to suit the market. And I just thought that information flow from the, from the product back to the production system and the tree is, was transparent and really could be replicated in, a, in our sheep industry if we really um, allow it to be um, and become a bit more cohesive. So to focus on product then, why do we actually need to worry about product, particularly when we're not really paid for it? And I think it is ultra important that we, we focus on product, and particularly for lamb being a, um, a product that's, well, I'll go to the next graph, and this, this, this is why I came to this conclusion. Now, this was in Kenya, and um, it really represents the growth of protein sources from um, up to 2030. And um, as you can see, not, there's no lamb there. Oh, that was my first thing. I just said, where is lamb? It's not even on there. So in terms of world protein sources, lamb's not on there. Um, so it, it's a smaller market than the other protein sources. So I think product really is important for us to focus on if, um, to make sure we've, we've got a product to sell. That graph coupled with this one, it, I just found it fascinating because it shows the difference in population growth from developing to the developed markets, and, and it really, um, we have to be uh, conscious of where we're sending our product, understanding that graph, and that there's not a lot of upside in the developed world, um, particularly if we drop our product quality. Because at the end of the day, they want safe, ethical, and healthy food, but they don't necessarily want to pay any more for it. We just expect that now. So we have to really get smarter at the way we farm. So, while I was in New Zealand, I visited a farm, um, Sam and Hannah Mora, in the North Island, and they've got, they, they individually manage all their, all their lambs, and um, they sent a truckload off, and half of the lambs came back over fat. And because they had um, these electronic tags in their ears, they could identify that the 50% over fat were actually the females. And so now they fatten the females on plantain, and the males on clover. If they didn't know that simple thing, they probably would have sent the same, or they may have made the wrong decision on why they thought the um, half the animals were over fat. So it was just a great example for me that was simple, but really effective at maintaining our product quality. So I, I toppled off to Denmark and, um, and had a look at what they're doing in, in uh, measuring, actually, product quality. And, uh, and this is the fatometer that they developed. They're doing a lot of work in pigs, but um, they're, they're working with Murdoch Guinea and the sheep chow seed on developing this, um, uh, uh, this implement that will measure intramuscular fat in the muscle. And the, the plan is to get it in line so it, it's, it's very, um, you know, effective. Um, so that's what they're working on. It's, it's very in process, uh, but, they, but it, we're definitely in this space, which is great to see. So from product, uh, really um, touch, uh, leading on to um, how important is maternal efficiency then in this whole production system. And I guess it just really um, compounds on what Tom was, uh, Tim was talking about, sorry, um, on this lambing percentage. To me, um, thinking back to the benchmarking graph I had up, um, table I had up earlier, lambing percentage really is important. And it's important for two main reasons, I think. One, it, does, it reflects the profit driver of our business. And two, it allows for selection pressure because it brings those replacement stock back in and allows us to then draft off the ones if we're going to the trouble of measuring unproductive stock. Uh, we, need, we need selection pressure coming in. If we're if we, if we are down in our, lamb, um, in our lambing percentages, we're forced to keep them and therefore we'll just be farming, you know, we'll keep that average to new line. To me, lamb, lamb, losing a lamb at birth and then shearing the wool and selling that is a bit like a grain farmer harvesting his grain, dumping it, and then selling the straw. And I don't think they'd do that, so I don't see why we should either. So this led me then to South Africa, um, and uh, this was a shed that, that uh, keeping on the cropping theme, cost the uh, equivalent amount of a 140 horsepower tractor, and he paid for it in two years. So. And, and, and the reason he put this shed up was because he realised that lamb, lambing percentage was his absolute 
limiting factor in his business. By doing this, he raised his lambing percentage from 138 to 171, and he also increased his weaning weight, which is a, another um, benefit of, of that. He selects on maternal um, behaviour, anything that's um, poor maternally or has to be assisted, he culls. And so he's, he's got some significant results um, in South Africa, and that's run by himself and two other labour units. Um, again, so this was another example in New Zealand. Um, and just to, just to explain it as clearly as I can, the top line, it rep, the whole graph represents ewe lambs um, scanning percentage success. So the top line are ewe lambs that were born from two tooth ewes. The bottom, the green and red lines were born from older ewes. And because he just marks age of dam to the lambs at lamb marking, you can see that a, a ewe lamb born from a two tooth will, can be two kilos lighter and have the same scanning percentage as a ewe lamb born from an older ewe, and that's just through genetics. And it's important that that's, that that's um, visual there because I think a lot of the time we could draft off those lighter lambs, mm. but in fact, they're just as uh, productive as, as, as any. So, so I thought that was a super example too. So back home, I, um, I thought I'd better do something useful and um, put this into practice. So I, I tried to mother up as many um, lambs to the users as I possibly could because this just being the number one thing I, and biggest potential area I, I thought. And this, this mob of use here, I can't really tell the difference, but um, you know, visually, it's very hard to tell the difference in production levels visually of these ewes. But the range was enormous. This ewe here, uh, the bottom ewe, sorry, it's not that exact ewe, but um, the bottom ewe gave me about $58 worth of lamb, up to the top of $230 worth of lamb, and that's taking out the extremes. So the range is just enormous, and I think that just represents the potential that we've still got in this sheep industry by, by looking at the detail that's within and measuring objectively and putting some economic data behind it. So graphically, this, this looks um, in terms of your efficiency, so lambs, wean, poo, uh, you live weight. It's, it's clear to see that the top 25% is, it can be two and a half times more efficient than the bottom 25% of ewes. And to me, this just amplifies the, the need for um, lamb survival again, because unless you're getting enough ewes back in, there's no, you, you can't physically take that bottom 25% off, and so you're forced to keep them. But it does just highlight um, the potential and and the the opportunity to I guess push the benchmark a bit higher by by selection on objective measurement. This was an example of how fertility can be selected for, and it was uh, I met up with the guys in the Department of Ag in South Africa, and it was a trial where they um, started with a mob of ewes, but then selected for fertility or un infertility basically. And um, you can see that how the lines got more and more divergent. And they had to finish the trial because there wasn't enough ewe replacements in the low fertility line to keep it going. But it just shows how um, it can be selected for if you want to select for it. Ultimately, I think this sums it up. Having the best producers unable to reproduce ultimately makes them unproductive. So that really links the three together. And, and I just googled the, defin re the definition of re, and it really it means to do it again. So if, if we want to focus on production, we have to focus on re because it, we need to do it again next year. So this is um, what I come up with. <laughs> we need to create the Prius of the sheep industry. <laughs> we really need to focus on how many kilos each year wins. This is my Prius. So we need a ewe that's Feed efficient, produces lambs with plenty of early growth, which are early maturing and, and therefore hits the joinable at you, as you lambs. And they'll raise the two lambs without me having to do much at all because at the end of the day we have to get more efficient with labour as well. Um, we can't do this without effective selection of our genetics. We, we bring genetics in whether we like it or not um, every year by ram selection. Now you can either go for the pick and mix option, or you can you can um, you can meet, you can bring in um, objective um, breeding uh, direction through breeding values. Um, so in order to drive this prayers, we really need to drive 
drive it by, by picking out the um, breeding values that are important to your business. And in a maternal's case, I think fat and muscle, early growth, and um, number of lambs ring really emphasises um, getting the most out of your fresh. So, it's, at the end, uh, without without um, dismissing that they also have to be structurally sound. So um, that's just without question, you you wouldn't uh, think of not including that. So these are a couple of the simple things I do using EIDs to um, take objective measurement on on um, on my place back home. Um, handsome looking chap there on the left, right. Um, you might <laughs> recognise him, past scholar, uh, scholar. Sorry. Um, so we pregnancy scan, uh, record everything there. Weighing condition score they use three times a year. Um, I monitor the lamb growth rate, and just to point out an interesting fact, the, the, the three lambs there, one's growing at 150 grams, one's growing at 250, and one's growing at 350, and they're all within a few kilos of each other. So oh, I couldn't pick that. I, I like sheep, but I couldn't pick that. So, um, so I just thought it was an interesting thing to monitor actual weight gain of your, of your lambs. So that's a lamb marking to 80 day um, weight which just emphasises more of the maternal side rather than the genetics coming through in the lamb. And then we're putting, um, we try to do as much as we can on, on matching you and lamb. And this is, I think, the area that has the most potential, but also is the hardest to measure. So I, I had four of these setups this year, but commercially speaking, it's probably not that practical. Um, it, takes a lot, it, it does take a fair bit of labour time. Um, but it's the best thing we've got at the, t at the minute of matching ewes and lambs. Uh, so I think to put in that extra effort, um, it, was, it, it, it can be worth it if, if, you, if you've got the set up for it. Um, additionally to that, around the world, people were, were measuring um, either paddock of lambing or paddock of finishing, the sex of the lamb, the age of the dam, uh, and the sire group. And then the holy grail, obviously, is to get the product feedback to tie it all in together. So going forward, um, re recommendations to the industry are um, this U to progeny link. Um, there, there is work being done, um, and I'm involved with with trials being being done on sensor technology. It's very early days, but uh, it's there and it's exciting, and um, and it can, well, ideally remotely link ewes and lambs um, through this technology. Then I think you can add a wool value per head to the to the end figure. You'll get a dollar figure per you at the end of the year, and you can make some selection decisions. Um, ultimately, I think we just need to put the Lamborghini motor back in the Lamborghini. <laughs> Thank you. Hey.